Hi everyone and welcome to the next video in the bug bounty series. In the previous series we looked a lot at starting out, so what kind of vulnerabilities to look for, but also what even is bug bounty hunting. In this series of videos we're going to go a bit more in depth, we're going to be talking a lot more about how to actually start hacking and then moving on to how you actually find your first bug. So a lot of the videos in this part of the series are going to be more around, okay, how do we choose a target? How do we get started on a target? What kind of stuff do we look for? What kind of methodologies are we gonna be using, etc. So in this series, we're gonna be looking more at that. So if you're already somewhat familiar with bug bounty hunting, maybe you've had a go, haven't been successful, this is what we're covering here. So this phase of the series is going to be more about that kind of thing. So I think you'll really enjoy it. As always, we've got to thank our amazing sponsor, Bug Crowd. A great hacker needs a great platform, and Bug Crowd is the home of the hacker. They provide hackers with the best opportunities to make money, advance their skills, build community, and unleash ingenuity through their security knowledge platform. They provide distinctive educational content for hackers. You can rapidly pick up new skills through Bug Crowd University or gain practical experience with one of their many monthly challenges. Or maybe you want to follow real hacking experts like myself as we cover methodology, shortcuts, and tools. Bug Crowd has an entire level up series unique to the industry that covers all of that. So if you're interested in joining Bug Crowd, head over to bugcrowd.com forward slash hackers now and join the Bug Crowd community. Thank you very much to Bug Crowd for sponsoring this video. Bug Crowd is sponsoring every single video in this series so you can learn bug bounty hunting and get started on Bug Crowd today. Thank you so much to Bug Crowd for sponsoring the video. So the very first kind of thing, once you sign up to Bug Crowd, you actually have a look, is you have this discovery page. Now the discovery page shows you basically every program that you can hack on. So if you're invited into private programs, public programs, however, as we will see, Bug Crowd does have some things that make it a little bit different if you've hacked on other platforms before. Um, you will see that bug crowd works a little bit differently and maybe to your advantage so the discovery page is the very first page that you see it shows you a bunch of stuff it will flag up programs that have new scope or high rewards so if you're maybe a beginner you want to look at some new scope you can actually have a look at just the programs that are updated and then you can see what the new scope is very easily. So once you've looked at the discovery page, you might find yourself on the programs page and the programs page is essentially the same data, but you can actually filter it. So you can look for your private programs that you've accepted an invite into. You can look at whether or not collaboration is enabled on the program. You can look at specific industries etc really helpful to just start to narrow things down but this does also show vdps and bug bounty programs so you can actually also filter by if it's a vdp the big change in bug crowd that you may not be familiar with that you may be don't know from other platforms is this idea of joinable programs so on bug crowd if you meet certain requirements you can actually join private programs and it's really clear what the requirements are and how to actually join them it's usually related to how many bugs you found so you do need to find a bug first but if you're already finding p4s for example this might be a really good opportunity to actually start getting private invites without necessarily having a ton of critical bugs straight off they tend to give you a little bit of information about it it's an electronics retailer it's a mathematical solutions provider that can tell you, okay, are you actually going to be interested in this or what? So you do have that element to it. It will also often link to things like your, your skills. It will have things like API hacking, for example, like specific skills. It will actually have its eligibility requirements down here. So this one requires at least four submissions that are considered valid an accuracy of at least 50%, so you need to accurately rate your bugs. You can't just rate a typical IDOR as a P1 
like a critical vulnerability unless you you genuinely believe that so you have to accurately rate your bugs you need at least a specific priority so depending on the program not every program will have this they usually have a submission count like that's quite common but for a minimum priority that's a bit rarer and here p3 plus submissions of all time at least one so you need at least one submission that's higher than a p3 other requirements you might see include specific countries if you're based in say the EU, you do need to verify your id but Again, fairly easy requirement to meet. Sometimes you just see submission count at least four and accuracy at least 50%. Accuracy is probably the big one that I see on most of these. So just bear that in mind. You also do find like over here a bit of information about the target scope. So this one is a web front end with Go and Ruby based GraphQL backend. Fantastic, great. I know GraphQL hacking, so this is going to be something that I want to hack. Crowdstream is Bug Crowd's version of Hacktivity, where people post bug found on blah, blah, blah. This is Bug Crowd's version of it. So it shows you both, depending on like the client sensitivity, so whether or not they opt into it. And by the way, if you run a bug bounty program, you should opt into this because it's really helpful for educational content creators like me to see what people are actually finding and do some research. If you look at the amazing stuff being done by Bug Bounty Reports Explain, Jesus Christ, you should definitely sign up to CrowdStream. But it also shows some redacted information as well. So it might just say submission accepted, submission claimed, but it won't say the exact target information. But it can give you an idea of the kinds of vulnerabilities people are finding if it's got that detail and also the kind of bounties people are getting as well. So the main thing you'll find yourself looking at is, of course, the program pages. The program pages gives you all the kind of ground rules, but also some information. So this is the Indeed program. Good program on BugCrowd. I really do recommend it. Lots of scope if you're a beginner. <laughs> They've got a lot of different elements of the job application process to have a look at. First up, we have a bit of information about Indeed. Then we have testing requirement. In this case, you need to add a bug bounty little thing to stop moderation from picking it up. And you should use your bug crowd ninja email account. Um, include bug bounty and the company title you create. Don't try and represent yourself as a real company. Add bug bounty to the request you're sending so the Indeed team can identify what you're sending them. Some ground rules, of course, and we've also got this little sidebar here. We're going to be talking more about that in a moment. Now, before I talk about the in-depth of the kind of statistics you should be looking at, and we actually go look at a program page, I want to talk about the states in Bug Crowd because you may not be familiar with them if you've not hacked on Bug Crowd before. So a new state means that it's a new issue and triage hasn't looked at it yet. So most submissions, new means no one's seen it. Not bug crowd, not the client. Triaged means that triage has said it's a valid issue. It is then still up to the program to review that and accept it or decline it. So if it gets accepted by the program and you're expecting a bounty, you'll get this state, which is unresolved. That's usually like when that changes to that state, that's usually when you get paid your bounty. You also get some points as well. Resolved is when a bug is marked as fixed. Now, if you can bypass the fix or if it hasn't been fixed properly, at that point you can submit a new report because as far as the client said, it's fixed. Now, informational or what previously was called won't fix is essentially they know about the issue either from your report or even previous reports. And for whatever reason, they do not intend on fixing it. Now, not every security vulnerability will be marked as too resolved by the customer. And that's because it's really expensive to actually fix security vulnerabilities. It takes a lot of manpower. You've got to get developers on board. You've got to get testing. You've got to do unit tests. It can be quite a lot. And for a vulnerability that doesn't necessarily impact that much, they may just decide, you know what, we're not in a position where we can fix it. Can that change? Yeah, of course it can change. Does that mean you shouldn't submit that bug? I would still submit it if I were you. 
But it is worth remembering that not everything is going to be fixed and not everything is even a candidate to be fixed. Now, the rejected submission states are out of scope. So you will receive a penalty if you go out of scope. Most bug crowd triages are very nice and they won't mark something as out of scope. They'll mark it as NA, but if you continue to go out of scope, they will mark it as out of scope and you'll receive penalties. Not reproducible. Triage or the client can't get the vulnerability to work. Again, you'll probably get NA before you get this. It's only if you start to submit a lot of vulnerabilities that are like not reproducible that you will get a penalty. Now, not applicable on bug crowd is a neutral state. It's not a penalty and it's not a positive state. It's just neutral. If you get NA, it will not affect your reputation. It does not affect your invites. It is just, for whatever reason, this is not applicable to this program, whatever. And I really want to stress that is not a negative state. That is just a, this doesn't apply to this program state. It doesn't get used for anything, I promise. If you get marked as a duplicate, your duplicate will be marked like in the original status and it will be linked. It inherits it. If a duplicate gets marked as resolved, but you can still do it, cause that issue, new report, it's a new issue or it's not been fixed properly. Known issues is on that little sidebar and this is where we start to talk about some of the statistics and I think it's really important to think about statistics in bug bounty hunting because actually the statistics can be really helpful for beginners for choosing what kind of programs you want to look at especially if you don't necessarily have a community yet and you can't just find out from other people like oh what programs do you really enjoy hacking i don't know because i've only literally just come here and i don't have any friends statistics can be a really great way of seeing that known issues it's only on some programs programs specifically have to say yes we want to show known issues which does mean that you won't necessarily see it on everything essentially it gives you an idea of how many duplicates there are so i'll use an example over here so you see this total issue this 278 so that is the total number of submissions including duplicates of known issues NAs as well. So it can give you the idea of the amount of duplicates that a program has. You see this total here, this 278. So that is the total count of issues. Now we can see here in unique, we've got 52. 52 is triaged, unresolved and informational. So these are issues which are still in the program for whatever reason. So 278 is this number. So if you do 278 minus 52, you get 226 issues that are in pre-triage or a duplicate or resolved or NA. If you take your resolved uh, vulnerabilities rewarded, so that's 150, so that's the total number of vulnerabilities this program has given bounties for, minus 52 that are still not fixed, you get 98 issues that have actually been resolved. Now, why is knowing that issues have been resolved important? If you want less duplicates, the easiest way to do that is to work with a program that is on the ball, that is answering questions and getting stuff sorted because you just will find less security issues, which sounds negative, but actually, if you think about it, if they're resolving all the P3s and P2s or P1s or whatever, if they're resolving those, any issue you find has a greater chance of being unique. And then you can do some more maths. The number of issues pre-triage or dupe or resolved minus the resolved issues mean, in this case, there's 134 either pre-triage or dupe or NA. That might suggest that this has a very high number of NA submissions. I think for this particular one, the validation is within three days. That's a good sign this is an active program. I would assume it was maybe NAs that were causing this. Again, best way to avoid dupes is to work with programs that are like really responsive and that want to work with hackers. So this is how Bug Crowd shows scope. 
and you can see here that on the side it actually covers things like the technologies in use. This is really helpful, especially if you're learning specific skills. So if you are, say, looking at, okay, what technology should I be learning if I'm doing bug bounty hunting? My suggestion would be go look at some big programs, Walmart, Indeed, Adele as well. Go look at some big programs and see what technologies they're actually using and then learn those. Don't take advice from me. I'm a PHP programmer and every advice I've ever given anyone is go learn PHP. But you can actually see what's in you. So you'll see a lot of React, for example. Super helpful to learn React. Really good technology to learn at the moment. You'll see some like more specific languages, potentially. You might see some Go, you might see some Ruby. Gives you an idea of where you can specialize. They will also show things like mobile testing as well. So you can see here that this is indeed this is like a super large attack surface and star in a bug bounty context this wild card can mean multiple things it might mean that every subdomain is in scope it can also mean that every asset that company owns that you can prove that company owns is also in scope and again you got to look through these for different programs in this case that they've said this is thousands of subdomains that they can't list however here's basically an idea now the indeed program and some other programs as well have this idea of primary targets and secondary targets so if you're hacking a primary target the bounties are going to be much higher and you can actually see this a p2 issue here starts from 1k to 4k and 4k to 10k for a p1 if you're looking at primary targets or maybe you want to hack something that perhaps hasn't had the same amount of scrutiny you might want to look at secondary targets or maybe if you're searching for bounties maybe you're a bit further along in your journey you might want to look at p1 and primary targets so let's take a look at some actual bug crowd scope pages these are all programs that i recommend because I think they are good for beginners, they're friendly, they're responsive, etc. Okay, so this is the bug crowd start page. So to get to the discovery, you want to go here, click on discovery. And this is that staff picks and new scope page I was talking about earlier. For example, we can see here that uh, Cloudinary has, I think, increased theirs. This is new scope here. So in this case, we can go to USAA. We can go to announcements and you can see that there's out of scope updates and stuff like that. So these can help if you are looking for something that is kind of new scope or something that's completely new. You can also see here that we can see some joinable programs here. You can tell they're joinable because they'll have vague titles like web API iOS and Android applications. And here you can see this is the one that has quite a lot of different requirements on it. We can see the here different priority ranges and the bounties and also this is a website, iOS and Android. And again, you can see there's some information about the vulnerability rewards as well. So this is the, I don't know, recommendations, I guess, is probably the easiest way to say it. And you can see here, you can see all the Atlassian stuff as well. There's also a just for you choose a target or explore an industry. So if you go to explore an industry, it will show you like banking and e-commerce and cloud. This can be really helpful, especially this e-commerce and retail one. If you learn like a specific industry vulnerabilities for e-commerce and retail, it's usually uh, business logic errors. You can actually just apply the same methodology over multiple programs super easily. And you can see this also like business management stuff as well the programs page here so the programs page is that like searchable one so you can throw in like accept an invites or vulnerability disclosure rewards so this will show you anything that's not a vdp but you can also add more stuff in here as well so you can see your pending invites the like whether or not you've participated in them specific industries again so you can start to like really dial down into the kind of programs you're looking for but again i've always found that most of my best results have been found from me just experimenting anyways let's take a look at indeed's program 
again i really recommend the indeed program it's a really great program the team is really responsive i found the announcements here this is going to show you when new targets get added the crowd stream is going to tell you what people are finding so here you can see this is on portal indeed flex this is just something owned by indeed this is on the graph ql endpoints this can be really helpful in saying what you should be looking at i see this here submission accepted on target graph ql it was a few days ago this to me says i want to look at that graph ql endpoint because it's very unlikely that if a p2 is being found that there are no p3s and no p2s there to find things and as i've said in some of my other videos i do not find good bugs <laughs> i don't find like p1s or crits i find like medium and like high bugs at the most because a lot of the bugs i find are easy bugs <laughs> they're not they're, again not super complicated i'm not that good at hacking etc <laughs> So again, you see there's another issue here on the GraphQL API. Another issue here on the GraphQL API. This is all telling me. Let's have a look at the program details and the actual scope. So you can see that this hasn't got those there, uh, like additional statistics that we saw in some of the other programs. So you can see here we have the vulnerabilities rewarded, validation within six days, and 75% submissions are accepted or rejected within six days. So what that means is that there is about six days until you get a bounty. So again, responsive program, we want to see a responsive program. If a program isn't meeting their response efficiency, that can imply that actually they can, they're gonna have a lot of duplicates because they're not necessarily fixing issues. You can see here we've got some information about don't violate the terms of service, don't violate the law. And here we can see the primary targets. So we have primary targets, secondary targets, and other targets. And you can see here that these have different bounty amounts because this is what they want you to focus on. So in this case, this stuff here is a secondary target and this stuff here is a primary target. And you can see this includes account information, profile information, that GraphQL API, an Android app, an iOS app, a Chinese iOS app, an Android app. The out of scope here is the chatbot, stuff they don't own, and some specific, again, chatbot stuff, and some specific websites. You can, once again, see some of the technology that they're using. This can be really helpful in deciding what to learn. For example, this is hosted on AWS, uses Bootstrap, Amazon CloudFront, jQuery, and something called Gatsby. So really helpful to see actually what technologies are my targets using? What can I learn? How can I learn those new skills? Because especially nowadays, I think it's I think it's been a case for a while, but especially nowadays in bug bounty hunting, having a specialty can be such a huge help. For me, it's API testing. For other people, it's recon or it's cloud or it's SSRFs or whatever, like business logic, whatever. All of that can be so helpful. It has some information about what it considers like a P1, P2, P3, or P4 issue. For if you use other bug bounty platforms, this is a crit, this is a high, this is a medium, and then this is a low. And again, stored XSS here is always going to be a high. That's not necessarily always going to be the case on other programs. So really helpful to know that. And there are some exceptions here that are the T. So the VRT, when you su submit it, will give you like a vulnerability. It'll give you like a priority, but they don't want HTML injection, self-XSS or email stuff unless you can demonstrate a risk. Some helpful tips for testing. A lot of programs will have these in helping you navigate the application, especially if it's not something you're familiar with already. And they also include a target overview so you can see what you want to have a look at. Immediately thinking profile and resume created, that's going to be one of their key functionality. But there's also like a developer API. They want you to focus on OAuth flaws. 
looking at privilege escalation, etc. That's an example scope page. Let's take another, another look at another scope page here. Credit Karma, this does have those known issues. You can start to think, okay, how am I going to approach this? Is this going to be a target that's responsive? See here, 75% of submissions are accepted or rejected within two days. So they're responsive. Great. Have they got a lot of known issues? Not too many. They've got a high number of rewarded vulnerabilities as well. Looking at this part of the the ratings and rewards, you can see this is not as, as detailed as Indeed's. And again, that's going to depend on the person you are hacking. Not every program is going to care about everything. It's just a nature of their business, right? They can't fix everything. So the they specifically call out open redirects and social media link hijacking as just stuff they're not interested in. So they don't want to hear about it. They don't want to, they're not going to fix it. Avoid looking for those. So you can see the program rules here is actually fairly slim. If you really do struggle with more complex scope and rules, some programs really will have rules that are like, don't just delete any information you access. Don't send the PII apart from the reproduction steps. Redact PII. Do not perform testing that includes brute force on registration and recovery. So again, standard scope, we have, in this case, their mobile apps. And down here, we have their web testing. And then we have their open out of scope ca uh, category. What can sometimes be confusing is if you have quite a lot of URLs that are in scope. And actually, when it comes to hacking them, you're stepping on a minefield with which ones are actually going to be considered out of scope or not. And again, we have tax support, tax help. And again, we've got that detailed breakdown of all the technologies. So WordPress, New Relic, PHP. We've got, these are not super helpful because they're like Swift. Yeah, it's an iOS application. <laughs> of course, it's called Swift. And here you can see a full list down here of their focus areas so authentication privilege escalation data exposure we've got web out of scopes ios and android out of scopes and you can get your credentials for a program programs that do have credentials can go either way for me sometimes they can be really helpful because when i self-register they get tend to set up multiple things you have to pay for example however i will say that it can be a huge burden on the hacker because you have to wait for those credentials to actually get assigned but it can go either way so let's look at one more of these i'm going to pick from the discovery i'm just going to pick randomly let's go for cloud Renee information about what they do and immediately after seeing this you can see that this is apis and development stuff these are really good to hack because if they are doing developer stuff a lot of other hackers will actually get very intimidated by them actually hacking them can be a really great way of finding unique bugs because nobody else is looking at them and we've got some general guidelines, some reward guidelines, our in-scope targets, our out-scope targets, super simple and straightforward, we like to see it. Um, some information on access, in this case you must use your Bug Crowd Ninja address, some of the focus areas, out-scope, and also excluded submission types. Now, again, these are really helpful because they can immediately tell you whether or not you should even bother reporting something and you won't report everything you find. Looking at the statistics over here, you can see that this is quick validation. The payout is potentially a little bit low, which suggests maybe there's a lot more kind of P3 issues, but it doesn't mean that there's no P2 issues or anything like that. If we have a look at the announcements, we can see there hasn't been any major updates. So we might want to say, you know what, this hasn't had any major updates. While it is responsive, it's not necessarily got new scope coming out. So maybe you want to skip this. Again, it depends on your hacking style and what you choose to hack. 
this kind of very technical programs can be actually really great to choose a target for because if you do have that technical expertise other hackers don't and at the fundamental end of the game like end of the day with bug bounty hunting is you're in competition with the other hackers they are your friends they are awesome they're very friendly but you were in competition with them you've got to make sure that you're like setting yourself up for success anyway let's go back to some final thoughts and what i think some of your main considerations should be when you hack on these programs as well as some bug crowd specific stuff that you may want to think about and consider okay okay welcome back i hope you found that helpful some other things to talk about specifically for bug crowd information vdps on bug crowds do not offer points vdps on bug crowd do not offer invites they are see something say something programs rather than come and hack me i've got presents they're good for testing new techniques on real targets getting a feel for a real website but if you do vdps if you smash a bunch of vdps you are not going to get any invites and you're not going to get any points you can't buy anything with kudos in reality so the best way to get invites on bug crowd is this crowd matching thing they sell it to their customers so you have a resume page you can fill out your resume with information about your experience or certifications you have and you can connect things like your github your stack overflow pen tester lab you can have preferences on invites and availability you can participate in programs create more get more active bugs consistency etc those are all better ways of getting invites specifically on bug crowd if the number one thing you can do on bug crowd to get private invites is literally just find bugs if you find bugs, you will get invites. It's true on all platforms, to be honest. Every single time that I like dust off my occasional bug bounty hunter and actually submit something, I get a ton of invites straight afterwards. Bug Crowd also has something called request a response. You might be familiar with this as being called mediation or appeals. Again, it's not really for choosing a program, but I think it's important to talk about. So you can actually request a response from Bug Crowd or the program if you're waiting on updates. There's a form you fill out. And if you are maybe wanting to choose maybe a program that's really receptive maybe you've had a poor experience in the past um, request a response might be something that kind of tips that balance for you so my suggestions pick a large enough scope to pivot within the application you do not want to be stuck on one piece of hacking for hours it doesn't feel good you don't feel like you're learning you feel like you're spinning in circles i find that i don't like huge scopes i like a smaller scope because i'm not like a big recon hacker if you're a big recon hacker obviously very large scope perfect for you but i like enough scope that i can pivot within the application so multiple functionality i can look at maybe an e-commerce system but there's also a social media aspect or there is also a chatbot access etc a program which has a quick validation time if when we we're looking at the actual program we saw an example of this but i want programs that are actually replying to issues i don't really want to wait months for a vulnerability just to go through the process usually the speed is on the program not on bug crowds triage triage tends to be quick but uh, clients can be very slow hence the request a response a super clear scope policy that you can follow so one thing that makes bug crowd a bit different is that you actually can't export the scope really easily into something like burp so being something that's clear that you can understand that makes sense I think huge advantage. I don't want to be wondering, oh, is this going to be considered out of scope? Because I just won't hack them. <laughs> I just, I won't do it. I won't bother. I won't waste my time. If I don't understand the scope page, I am out of there. And looking at the program statistics, kind of understand how many duplicate issues they are, how quickly are they actually resolving bugs. And trust me, guys, 
I know how it feels to find a vulnerability, get very excited, and then get told it's a duplicate. Everybody experiences that. You are not alone if you have experienced that, and that is something that you are getting super frustrated with. That's so normal. It's so normal. So these are my advice. Larger scope, good validation times, something you're familiar with or already use. So if you don't need to learn the functionality, it's a huge advantage. I've literally spent hours looking at trying to understand how an application works from a user perspective, let alone from hacking. Just understanding what how the application is supposed to work in the first place. Clear scope makes a lot of sense, seems very clear and looking at those program statistics, trying to divine whether or not this is a really responsive program and stuff is actually getting fixed reasonably. That's all I've got for you today, folks. I hope this was really helpful and I hope that this encourages you to get started. I will say that I have also had success in choosing a program randomly and just trying it out. I don't think you can really properly game the system. Sometimes you get lucky and sometimes you don't. Now, these are great ways to maybe tip the scales in your favor, but when you find your first bug and your first few bugs just in general, there is a luck factor. The more experienced you get, the less of a luck factor there is, because as you get more experienced, you'll develop your intuition, but also your like actual knowledge of vulnerabilities as well. But saying that, I know this is something that a lot of people wonder about, and especially because my previous video was like a different platform. Maybe this gives you insights on another one. So I hope you found that helpful, and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye, everyone.